So, uh, okay. Be'ezer Hashem, we begin the Sechta Nadarim. Um, so I just want to point out for the, I do have some audience that listens online. Um, so my name is Baruch Gross. This is my email. And right over here is my phone number. So if you ever need to reach me. Um, so let us begin with Masech the Nadarim, which discusses the Psukim. And um, we'll just do two Psukim, because that's the, the thrust of what we're going to discuss tonight. And then we'll do the Mishnah and the Gemara. It's going to go very quick. A very short Dafim. Um, first, the Pusik says like this in Parshas Matois. The Pusik says, Vaidaber Moshe El Roshe Hamapis. Moshe spoke the following laws about Hilchis Nadarim to the president of each Shevet. Rashi Hamatis is the president of each Shevet of Levnei Yisrael, of each, of each tribe of Bnei Yisrael, Lema saying. Now, normally, mm-hmm. normally, when Moshe Rabbeinu taught the Torah, he first taught it to Aharon, and then he taught it to, to the Nesim, the president, and then he, uh, it was repeated again for the Bnei Yisrael. There was like a, uh, it was, it was, there was a procedure. Here, the, the Pusik just drops in and just says, Moshe spoke the whole parsha to the Rashi Hamaktis, to the president of the tribe of Bnei Yisrael. And this hints that there's something unique about Nadarim, about a vow, that's yeah. called oath, that uh, a vow that only, uh, that only a president can deal with, which means that there is a concept that a Yachid Mumcha, somebody who is just an individual, can be Mater Neder. So it really, even one person who is an expert on Hilchis Nadarim, he could uh, he could untie the vow that you made. Usually, now we go to three people. If you have a vow and you want to untie it, you go to three people. But that's the idea that the Pasuk says, El Rashi Amatis. All right, Sheldon, we just began. We're just discussing the Psukim over here. So the Pasuk says like this, Zeh HaGavar, said, the following is the, the, the word, the exact word, Ashatziva Hashem, that Hashem spoke. Only Moshe Rabbeinu could say the word Zehadavar. This is precisely what Hashem said. All other Nevi'im could say only Koy Omar Hashem. So said Hashem, because they weren't, they didn't have that kind of clear prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu, who had, so to speak, the Shechina speak from his throat. And then we're going to just do one Pasik over here. Ish Kiyidon Ish, a man. He has to be over by mitzvah. Or he even very close to bar mitzvah. He yidder neder lashem. What does he mean? Yidder. He makes a he makes a vow. Neder lashem, a vow to the abishta. So what does that mean? A vow to the abishta. So what the simple meaning of the pasuk is that sometimes a person, let's say, is eating meat too much, and he feels that eating meat so much will bring to gaiva and sins and whatever. So he makes a nether for the sake of Hashem not to eat meat anymore. So that's called a vow, and he's doing it for the sake of Hashem. Just generally, you don't have to make a vow for the sake of Hashem. Um, you can make a vow even if it's not for the sake of Hashem. But, um, but the point is the point is that um, uh, this, this idea of nether Hashem is 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 what the Pasuk is saying. But the Pasuk is also implying something else. And this is very important. And probably most important point in the Dharam. That the way to make a vow, what the Torah is saying, is if you say that the object should be like something that's already um, uh, dedicated to Hashem, so to speak. What's, let's say you say all meat should be like a carbon. That makes all meat prohibited on you like a carbon. So you're saying to yourself, I, I want all meat to be like a carbon. So you learn two things from that point. One thing that you learn is that a vow, a nether is unique, that you're not prohibiting yourself on the meat, but what you're basically saying is all meat should be usher to me. So you put the, the vow on, on the meat itself. On the meat itself, now becomes prohibited to you. So if you say, all meat should be prohibited to me, that already, that's a vow. But then there's another way to saying, I want all meat to be like a carbon. Well, a carbon is something that's uh, a regular person can't eat a carbon. It belongs to Hashem. So if you're saying that every piece of meat or whatever food you want to answer, 
and you say every piece of food should be like that carbon, that also uh, effectuates a vow. So you see two things from there. One, that the nether is on the object itself. And two, that you don't have to say that I want meat to be usser. You just have to say, I want meat to be like something that is usser, like something else. And then it becomes usser. We'll, we'll learn limitations of that because it's not by everything. You can't say, I want meat to be like Nevela because already Nevela is not something that you made also. It's Hashem who made it also. It only works if you, uh, if you latch it on to something that you made also. So you can say, I want you know, meat to be like a carbon. Next. So that's a, a vow. Or you shove a shvur, you made an oath. Here, you see it clearly. Uh, an oath, a shvua, is something that you place it upon yourself. The prohibition is on you, not the food, not the food item. So you're saying, I swear I'm not going to eat meat. So that's the point. Now, what is the difference between nether and shvua? Obviously, there's three differences. One difference is one difference is that you can't mix and match. You can't say, uh, I swear that all meat should be also to me. That, that, that doesn't work because you're putting the, 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 the prohibition on the object itself. And a shvua is on you, not the object. And same thing with a nether. You can't make a vow that I'm not going to eat meat. That's not a vow. So you can't mix the languages. But what you also see is a very important point, and that we'll, we'll come to that point, is that you can't make a shvua I'm not going to put on, I'm not going to go into a sukkah. Why? Because before you were born, uh, but your soul took an oath, you took an oath, a shvua, that you're going to keep the Torah mitzvahs. So how could you make a shvua to violate that prohibition? You have a responsibility to keep the oath of keeping the mitzvahs. However, a neder would work. And here's the remez, neder l'ashem. You, uh, you can make a vow that asks you to do mitzvahs. How? Because the, since the neder prohibition is on the object itself, you can say, I prohibit upon myself all sukkahs. So then every sukkah has a prohibition on me that I can't benefit from a sukkah. So, so to speak, I went the back route of not being, uh, of having a vow that does not allow me to fill a mitzvah. So a neder could be against the mitzvah, a shvua cannot. On the other hand, a shvua has one thing that a neder doesn't have. Neder needs an object to be, to have, to, 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 to latch on to like food item, drinks, that sort of thing, a bed, whatever you want. But a shvua, you can make a shvua, I swear I'm not going to sleep. So sleep is not an object where you sw swear I'm not going to talk. Talk is not a, uh, talk is not something, an object. So in that case, a shvua would work, a nether would not work because a nether has to have an object to, to latch itself onto. Otherwise, you can't make a nether. Okay, so that's the introduction over here, and that's everything what we're going to discuss. Um, the, 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 you'll see that there are five topics that we're going to discuss that in Parshas Matas, it discusses a per, private person who makes a nether, how he, how, how, he, um, how he gets rid of that nether. Then we, the Torah also discusses, let's say you have a teenage daughter. There, the father can nullify his nether. Her father can nullify. If she makes a nether, a 12-year-old, her father can nullify the nether. If she's engaged, that 12-year-old is engaged, then the father plus the new husband could nullify the nether. And then the Pasuk discusses whether if a, a, a woman who lost her husband, a widow, or a divorcee, so once she's already divorced, the Torah discusses and says that she is responsible for her own nether. Nobody can nullify her nether without her, without her permission. And then a married woman, a married woman who makes a nether, the, the, the law is that the husband can nullify her her nether. Okay, that's the basic introduction. We're using the Talmud Bavli, as you can probably see. I use the Steinzaltz uh, Tzura Sadaf from the Koran, and let us begin. The Mishnah begins, Kol Kinuye Nedarim. Any Kinuye is a substitute for nether is Kinedarim. What the Mishnah is saying is that we said that one of the ways to make a nether is you say that this food item should be like a carbon. Let's say you didn't say the word carbon. Carbon is a, a Hebrew word. You use the word, um, you let it, let it be like a kainim. 
or Koinech, or Koinis. There's, there's substitute names, which we'll see in the next Mishnah. The Mishnah is going to give you sample substitute names for the word carbon. And so the Mishnah says, any substitute uh, for a nether, substitute name for a carbon, is like a nether. In other words, if you did not say, I want this item to be usher to me, instead of saying, this should be usher to me, you said, this item should be like a carbon. Instead of saying the word carbon, you use the nickname for a carbon, a, a, a Goyesha name for a carbon. We'll see what, what, what where these names come from. So then it, it's the nether is effectuating. The charamim, if you want to dedicate something to the Beis HaMikdash or to a kayin, here it means to a kayin, ke charamim. A charamim means normally there's a way to dedicate something to the Beis HaMikdash. One, you say a charam, that this item, let's say you have a watch and you want to dedicate it to the to the Bedek Abayis or the Beis HaMikdash, I read this, I'm, I'm dedicating this to the Beis HaMikdash. That's called Cherem. Or you say, I'm dedicating this to a Koyhein. So that means it's almost like, it's like Truma. You must give it to the Koyhein. Let's say you didn't say the word Cherem, but you say a word that 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 is a substitute for the word Cherem. So the, the, the Ram says, cheret, cheret, cheret. So these are nicknames, substitutes for the word cherem. It also effectuates the cherem. One thing I want to mention, by the way, and this is important, as uh, I forgot to mention, is that in the Sechta Nidorim, one thing is that the Mesechta itself does, uh, is, uses a little bit foreign language, a different language than the rest of the Gemaras that we we in the rest of the Talmud that we've learned so far. And it could be that they say that uh, it wasn't re-edited. Furthermore, uh, what appears on the side as Rashi, and it says here Rashi, according to most opinions, it's not that Rashi wrote it. When they first printed the Gemara in Italy, the Bamberg edition uh, from Daniel Bamberg, so Daniel Bamberg, I should say, he, he it, it appeared as Rashi, but then it was discovered later on that the language, it, uh, the language is very different than Rashi, or uh, it, it's it's clear that it differentiates with opinions what Rashi wrote elsewhere. So they do not attribute this as Rashi. It's, they call it the Mefarish, the explainer. They don't know who wrote it. Hence, because of that, therefore. Uh, they included in every Masechta of Nidaram, the Ram. Ram is like a mixture of explaining the Gemara and Taisvis. So it's very lengthy, but very Gishmak, because it, it brings up uh, kashas that you might have ignored if it was a separate Pirish, a uh, Grashi and Taisvis. Now you, 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 you're almost forced to learn both. So you have to pick and choose what's, what's, what's relevant and what goes with the flow of the Gemara. But that's the, the, the run and, and, uh, of this Masechta, very unique to this Masechta. Anyway, back into the Gemara, sh- back into the Mishnah, Shavuos Keshavuos. If you make a, a swear and you don't use the word Shavua, instead you wor- use a fake name for a Shavua. You use the word um, like shvu- uh, Shavusa. Shavusa, the Gemara learn, is a nickname. So instead of the word, I Shavua shvu- that I'm not going to eat, you say Shavusa. It's an exact, you, you have a Shavua. And Nazir is Nazir is a nickname for a Nazir. If you don't use, I'm going to be a Nazir. I put the Nazir on me. Instead, you were, use a language called Nazik, Paziach. Instead of using the word Nazir, you somehow use the nickname, a substitute language, Kinaziris. That's like Kinaziris. Okay, that's the first din of the Mishnah. Substitutes are like the actual thing. Now the Mishnah says a new thing, what's called a Yad. A yad is, is like a handle, an intimation, a hint. In other words, even if you don't say, this thing should be ushered to me, but I understand from your language that's what you want to do, even though you did not say the word usher. So it's like the handle of a teacup where you, where you could lift the cup with the handle. So the, the, the chiddush of this is that even if you didn't say the word usher, since I understand what you mean, so that we make that into a nether. So same thing like this. Somebody says to his friend, Mudrani I am avowed from you. Or, uh, right, I'm avowed from you. Mufrashani mimcha. Or I'm separated from you. Muruchakani mimcha. I'm distance from you. What does that mean? I have, I'm distance from you. Shani oichelacha, shani taimlacha. 
the food, the food that you have is going to be distance from me, or the drink that you have, or the uh, or things that I could taste will be distance from me. Whatever, in other words, he's putting a prohibition on the other person's foods, his friend's food. He doesn't want to have benefit from his friend's food. Now, but he didn't say they're usher to me. He said, he said, I'm avowed from it. He didn't say they're usher. He said, I'm separated from it, right? Or I'm distanced from it. So all these things, he put the prohibition on the food, but he didn't say I am prohibited, but he hinted to it. So then it's usher, it's usher. But if he said, menuda ani lecha, if he said, I am ostracized from the food, your food, let's say he says, I'm ostracized. Well, menuda is, is, a, is an expression like you use that uh, individual is ostracized. You never use that on a food item, on an object, on an inamitable, you know, a, a non-human. You don't use the word menuda. You can say that so-and-so is a cheirem, that nobody should talk to him. But that's on a human. But you don't use that that kind of language on a on a, a item of food. So according to the Tanakhama, it means nothing. But Rabbi Kiva Choichich, he was doubtful. Bazel he said you should consider it as a vow. And Choichich means like he closed his lips. He didn't want to say it's aser, but he didn't want to say it's mutter. So if if someone violated such a vow, you would not get malchus. The Pasik that says, by the way, not to violate the Malkus, we, we should have seen that at the end. Lo yachel devorah, yinalado, yinalado, um, defile all the word the word that you said, the vow that you said, or the oath that you said, and the Torah stresses, so that's a lav, a, a negative commandment. Then the Torah says, kechol hayoitzi mipiv yase, anything that comes out of your mouth, you have to do. So you can't think about a neder, it has to come out of your mouth. But a yad is, we consider it as if the whole thing came out of your mouth, even though you didn't say the whole nether, but since I can, I can, I can, you hinted to it and it's self understood, so we consider it a nether. So we finished Ahmed Aleph, we go to Bez Ahmed Bez. Now the Gemara is just very fast. Gemara says, Kol Kinidarm Kinidarm. That's what the Mishnah said. So the Gemara asks the question, Every substitute of a nether is like a nether. Why is it that Masech and Nazir begins and that's it. It doesn't give you other examples of substitutes or like the substitute of like the main thing. And by nether, we give you a bunch of examples. A kinuya nether is like a nether, a shvur is like a shvur, a cherem is like a cherem, etc., etc. So why did we go and give you the long list? And in Masech the Nazar, we gave you the short list. Answers the Gemara. Yeshua in our Masech, the Neder of Shur, Ksi Begabe Adadi. Then the word Neder and Shur say in the same Pasuk as we saw before. In the Pasuk over here, it says, Yish Ki De Neder Hashem, or Yishav HaShvur. So once you're mentioning Neder, you're automatically going to mention Shur in the same. So once you're mentioning two of them, the Tani Tartim, you have to write two. The cave in the Tani Tartim, since you're mentioning two, Tana, Tana, that's why we're going to mention all of them. Okay, since you're mentioning two, you can mention all of them. So then, so which are the main things? Nether and Shvua. So if you look at the order of the Mishnah, what does it say? Kokni and Nedarim, the Haramim, Kicharamim, and then it goes to Shvua. So now you can ask the most question. If, if Nether is linked uh, arm in arm with Shvua, so then the Lisne Kuni or Shvuas, Boston Nedarim. After you're mentioning the substitute of Nedarim, mention Shvuas. The, that should be the next example of a kini of shvua is like a shvua. Answers the Gemara. I did since I did the Tony Nadarim. Since we mentioned Nadar, which is the mitzvah chatzei ale, that you're answering, you're prohibiting the object on you. That's basically what a vow, what a what a vow is. Toninami charamin. That's why we make then the next case is dedication. If you're dedicating, let's say your watch. It's you're dedicating it to the Bede Kabayas. You're dedicating it for a Kayim. It's also the Mitzvah Chavzei Alei. It's prohibiting the object on yourself. So they're similar. Neder and Cherem are similar. La Puke Shvua, but we, a Shvua is not part of that group because a Shvua is different. And like we said, the you are prohibiting yourself on the item. So that's why a Shvua is much, much different than a, than a Neder. Okay, as we explained, the three differences between a shvua and a neder. Now the Gemara says, okay, but 
the Mishnah is a little strange. Pasach Bikinuin, it starts talking about the idea of substitutes. It doesn't give you examples of what a substitute is, uh, but that's the next Mishnah, called Kinyunidorim. Uh, all nether, all, all substitutes of a nether is like a nether. And then it doesn't give you examples. But then, Umafarish Yadis, it starts talking about the yad of a nether, the, intimate, the hint of a nether, the intimations of a nether. It's a totally different law. It's halacha aleph, and it's teach, and then it starts talking about halacha beis. The su the Kamara says, if it's part of the Mishnah, yadis inshu. Why didn't it, it forgot the word yadis? Uh, that, that, that's this. You see, this is an expression that doesn't really appear anywhere else in the Talmud. Yadis inshi. This 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 language. But anyway, how come it does not mention the word yadis in the Mishnah? It just like assumes you know it. And so the Mishnah is giving you two halachas. So the Gemara says, I read behind. The Mishnah does talk about it. The Chasuri Mechas Rebachi Kitani. Some things are missed. There, there are a few words missing in the Mishnah. Call Kinu Nadarim Kinadarim, Yadis Nadarim Kinadarim. Or all substitutes of an adder is like an adder, and the handle of an adder is like an adder. So that's what it's missing that. It's missing those, that word, Yadis Nadarim. So the Gemara says, the lift reich kinuya let it let it talk about substitute. That should be the first topic in the Mishnah. Why does it jump to Yadis? If it's if if it's telling you halacha aleph and halacha beis, now start explaining halacha aleph. And so the Gemara, Very often the Mishnah will discuss the last thing that it mentioned as the first thing is it wants to open a discussion. So we'll say halacha aleph, halacha beis, and then discuss halacha beis, and then get back to halacha aleph. So it, it mentions kinui and yadais, and then gets and then talk, discusses yadais, and then the Mishnayis will go back to talking about kinuyim. Where do we find this idea? Kidetnam, the memad likim, what can you use as, 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 what, what can you light the, the Nera Shabbos? What's not allowed to be used? A madlikin, it first gives you the A madlikin, even though it says Bame Madlikin first. The Ma Taimnin, the Ma Taimnin, what could you insulate? What can you insulate? And then the Mishnah says Ain Taimnin. So you see it 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 it's it, it's halacha aleph, halacha beis. It starts discussing halacha beis. Bame ishi yaitza, bame ain yaitza. What can it when she, what can she, what kind of jewelry she can wear on Shabbos and what not? And light takes each she should not go out. So we see that the Mishnah does has that kind of a parrot. So the Gemara asks back, well, I'll bring you a couple of Mishnahis where the Mishnah does not have that pattern. If, if it says halacha ala, and then halacha beis, it will not go back and explain halacha ala first. Well, tonight we learned in the Mishnah, yesh neichelin manchilim, neichelin v'loi manchilim, ve'elu neichelin u'manchilim. So it gives you a list of those that can inherit and bequeath, uh, bequeath and not beherit. So it gives you a, a, a four different pasta scenarios. And then it explains scenario number one, and then explains scenario number two, and scenario number three, and scenario number four. So in that case, in the Mishnah, in Baba Basra, we go in order. We say, Halacha Aleph, Beis Gimel Dalet, and we start explaining Halacha Aleph. In Mish Yavamas also we had the same thing. Yesh mitaris l'balei and v'asuris l'yavayim. Sometimes you mutter to your husband and also to your brother-in-law. Mitaris l'yavayim v'asuris l'balei. Ve'el mitaris l'balei and v'asuris l'yavayim. Again, it gives you three or four cases where you mutter to both, your husband and your brother-in-law. Sometimes you mutter to your husband, not your brother-in-law. Sometimes you mutter to your brother-in-law, not your husband. Whatever those cases are, kain gadol to amamana, etc. But then it explains halacha ala first. It doesn't explain the last case first. Yesh, another example. Yesh tuun Hashem lebaina, Hashem lebaina, ve'elu tuun Hashem lebaina. Some anuchas need uh, oil and frankincense. Some need oil and no frankincense, and some need nothing, except etc. Et and these are the following. It, it starts explaining the number one halacha alav. Again, yesh tuun agasha ve'en tuun atnufa, tnufa le agasha ve'elu tnufa agasha. Yesh bechol nachla ve'en bechol lekayim, bechol lekayim ve'en bechol nachla. Ve'ezer bechol nachla ve'en bechol lekayim. So what the Gemara just did over here was bring a couple of Mishnayis all around Shas, where the Mishnah will list a, a, a four halachas and then go back explaining the halacha arab. So the question is, how come in our Mishnah we give halacha alif, halacha beis, and we start explaining halacha beis first and then go back to halacha alif? What's the difference between those Mishnayis and our Masechta? Answers the Gemara, halain, again, another word you don't find too often in Shas, 
though those cases that you just brought, Mishum the Ashru Lay, Mefarshu the Pasuk Barasha. Since those are a list of numbers, those cases are, are cases of four, where the Mishnah lists four possibilities and then goes back and explains possibility number one, possibility number two, etc. Because since there's a long list, the, the, the Mishnah is felt you would forget what's, uh, list, what's on the first on the list, so it goes back and explains number one. But if there are only two on the list, like in our case, our Mishnah has Kinui and Yodais, so then it could very well go in Yodais and then get back to Kinui. Kinui. So the Gemara asks one final question. There's a Gemara, the Mishnah says, what can an animal go out with? What can an animal not go out with? And then in Mishnah explains, it only this, it explains, ashva. It's not a long list. It's just two possibilities. The Ketani, a camel could leave, it could wear certain jewelry, whatever it wears. So it explains first, halacha, this halacha, and then it explains, so the question is, why is our Masechta different? Why is our Mishnah start off with Kinuyim, then Yadais, and then go explain Yadais first? It doesn't go in order. So the Gemara answers the one carrots. You can't really, the Mishnah sometimes are, are not so precise. And it depends who the author of the Mishnah, Zin and sometimes a Tana Mafarish, who the Pasuk Barasha. Sometimes some Tanarim will explain the first thing that they mentioned and start elaborating the first thing that they mentioned, like in the case of Bameh Behema Yotza, and there's Zin and who the Salat Mafarish Barasha. And like in our case, um, uh, that w we end off, what the last thing that we discuss is this thing that we're going to mention first. So again, so we just, uh, we did the today's daf, and we just left off on daf Kimul Amar Aleph, the second the second line. And of course, the Gemara is going to give tomorrow, Mitzvah Shem, another teretz to why our Mishnah discusses Yadais first before Kinuim, if the Kinuim is the first thing that the Mishnah mentioned. Okay. Shikaya, thank you. Shikaya. Uh,